Hey guys, George and I have made so many new friends this week and have had so much fun talking all things Dirty Bits and beyond with you. We'd like to thank our new fans, Jen, Kelly P, Tim, Nick, Paul, Maja, Tammy, Ariel, Kimber, Steven, Rhett, Heather, Dave S, Tilly, and Mindy. Thank you so much for hanging out with us and supporting the show. Without our listeners, the Dirty Bits podcast wouldn't be possible. And well, we love you guys. After the show, get your mind out of the gutter and enjoy promos from some of our favorite podcasts, Historical Blindness, Murder Under the Midnight Sun, Omitted, and The Brain Trust Brothers. Enjoy the episode. Hi, I'm Tawny Plattis, and you're listening to Dirty Bits, the podcast that explores the dirty bits of history your teacher probably left out. Peggy Guggenheim may be the most challenging episode I've ever undertaken on the Dirty Bits podcast. The inspiration for this podcast centers around my belief that intimate details give humanity to what can sometimes seem like unrelatable historic figures. Yet, I grappled with the fact that she is well known for her sex life. So much so, that what many considered her scandalous private life has often overshadowed her numerous accomplishments. But it's also through three of her own memoirs, based on an original manuscript she called Five Husbands and Some Other Men, that she willingly and bluntly shared her bedroom details. My book was all about fucking, she once said of her memoirs. So, they weren't really secrets, which is partially the shtick of the Dirty Bits podcast. But that's only if you know who Peggy Guggenheim is in the first place, and since you millennials are too busy eating avocado toast instead of reading books, I'm going to educate you. While the later editions of her sexy tell-all were more conservatively titled Out of the Century, the book was regarded as so salacious and offbeat in the 60s when it was first published that she was given the snarky nickname, Out of Her Head. Peggy has been called the mistress of modern art. She was an American heiress who created an unprecedented modern art collection of what is considered the most influential art of the early 20th century. She's credited with essentially inventing Jackson Pollock, whom she would later consider her greatest discovery. Her collection survives today, as the Peggy Guggenheim Collection at her Palazzo in Venice, Italy. She also engaged in activities that women are still shamed for today by keeping hundreds of lovers, having several abortions, and labeling herself a nymphomaniac. Marguerite, or Peggy Guggenheim, was born in 1898 when people cared about children just as much as they cared about a torn shoe. The Guggenheims were a part of New York's traditionally wealthy German-Jewish community. At the time, Jewish people faced discrimination in the education system. Hotels would be like, hey, we don't want you staying here, go fuck yourself. So they lived in this very insular world where they kind of assimilated, but not really. Her dad's family had made their fortune in the mining business, and her uncle was Solomon Guggenheim, who founded the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum and was a full-time collector of expressionist and surrealist pieces. Her and her uncle were actually collecting art at the same time, but he wasn't supportive at all, thinking she was a stupid woman collecting a bunch of crappy finger paintings that weren't really up to snuff. You know, Kandinsky and Mondrian, garbage like that. But her mother's relatives, the Seligmans, came from this snobby-ass banking family that looked down at the Guggenheims, and they were like, those social climbing basic bitches just got lucky with that whole mining thing, and they are not very classy people. But Peggy's mom, Florette, was like, he has incredible bone structure, don't tell me what to do, I'm 24, and I know everything. Both of Peggy's parents were considered eccentric. Her father, Benjamin, was a handsome engineer and had an income of over $250,000 a year in the early 20th century. But he led an extravagant lifestyle spent money recklessly, owned homes in New York and Paris where he kept several of his lovers, like father, like daughter. He eventually left the family business, made some atrocious investments, and was an all-around ding-dong of a businessman. Peggy's mother, Florette, 
repeated every sentence she spoke three times, wore three coats at once, three watches, and sprayed Lysol over everything. Which sounds something like a bit closer to an undiagnosed and misunderstood obsessive compulsive disorder, rather than simply mom's funny little habit. And supposedly, Peggy's aunt Fanny used to sing every sentence out of her mouth, which allegedly caused her husband to attempt to murder her with a baseball bat. Peggy was predominantly raised by a slew of nannies because her mother couldn't be bothered, and she wasn't allowed to have any of her friends over. She also kept this enormous dollhouse that she filled with mini bearskin rugs and ivory furniture. She had it all locked up and wouldn't let anyone touch it, which isn't foreshadowing in the slightest. Then in 1912, her dad gets on this little old ship called the Titanic and goes down into the depths while in full evening wear, smoking a cigar and drinking scotch. As I mentioned, he was the hottest of messes and had left all of his affairs in an absolute clusterfuck. So by the time Peggy came of age, she described herself as no longer a real Guggenheim. Despite the report, that her first inheritance was $450,000, which is around five million-ish dollars today. And then she got that same amount again when her mother died in 1937. But when her dad passed, the Guggenheims were so stupid wealthy, they were like, ha ha, you're poor. And Peggy had to move to a cheaper apartment with fewer servants. And it was a really, really rough time for the family to scrape by on such a pittance. But Peggy really did feel like the black sheep of the family. She wasn't into the whole social scene in the wealthy Jewish community like her mom and sister were. And the other girls at school weren't super down with Peggy either. She found herself unattractive and underwent a rhinoplasty in her early 20s that the new doctor botched with somewhat disastrous results. So she's like, fuck it, I'm going to shave off my eyebrows and GTFO. Bye guys, I'm going to Paris. Viva la bohème. And her mom's like, I don't trust you as far as I can throw you. Cool your jets, I'm coming with you, and so is your cousin. And Peggy's like, ugh, fine. So she arrives in France where she discovers the avant-garde community and she goes, oh, my god, I've found my people. There's all this inspiration and creativity and just je ne sais quoi. I must be a part of this. So she starts hanging out with Man Ray, Marcel Duchamp. She's playing tennis with Ezra Pound. She just wants to be a part of this art world. But Peggy can't paint herself out of a brown paper bag, so she gets creative by making it her business to promote the artists. She's obsessed with losing her virginity when she's 23, writing in her diary after discovering photographs of frescoes from Pompeii. They depicted people making love in various positions, and of course I was very curious and wanted to try them all myself, she says. And that's when she's reunited with Lawrence Vale, who's this older painter, writer, educated Oxford man, and he makes this pass at Peggy when they're alone. And she's like, yeah, let's do this right here, right now. And he's actually taken aback by how forward she is. And he gets all flustered and says, uh, your mom might be home like any minute. Just come to my hotel later. So she grabs her hat and says, later means now, baby. They end up getting married in 1922, and it's a total shit show right off the bat. He drank through full-blown temper tantrums like a toddler when he wasn't getting enough attention was verbally and physically abusive, and Peggy dangled his financial dependence on her over his head. They divorced after seven years of marriage when he cheated on her with writer Kay Boyle. Peggy later said, he became my best friend afterwards, after he stopped beating me up. She had two children with Lawrence, Sinbad and Peggyn. Imordino Vreeland, the director of the documentary I highly recommend, Art Addict, describes Peggy as being a byproduct of her upbringing, so she really didn't know how to be a mother, which is the kindest way I've ever heard her mothering style described in all my days as a researcher of sexy history. She let her ex have primary custody of her son, but kept her daughter while she started dating a new guy. She had a particularly screwed up relationship with her daughter, Peggyne. Peggy lived the whole bohemian socialite lifestyle and didn't have time for that whole parenting nonsense that comes with choosing to have a child. By all accounts, she didn't look at Peggy as a daughter, but more as a friend, 
telling her entirely too many details and involving her in the drama of her personal sex life. She was indifferent to her children and controlling at the same time, wanting to tell Peggy how to live her life while simultaneously wanting her to stay out of the way. An oblivious narcissist, the bitch got a dog and named her Peggy and then couldn't figure out for the life of her how her daughter of the same name could possibly be offended. They argued frequently and ferociously, and as Peggy got older, Peggy started viewing her as a threat to her frequent bedroom conquests. Her daughter suffered from severe depression, which she spoke about openly and attempted suicide multiple times. After her daughter passed from an overdose, Peggy blamed Peggy's husband and then dedicated a wall in her gallery to Peggy's own work. Sinbad, Peggy's son, once simply remarked that both Peggy and his stepmother, Kate Boyle, were bitches. In 1941, she married once more to Max Ernst, who she viewed as a baby who was deposited on her doorstep. When asked why she married him, she simply said, because he's so beautiful and because he's so famous. Duh. She gets him out of Europe, supports him, and he goes around cheating on her. They eventually divorced. People used to say Ernst once had a Guggenheim, but it wasn't a fellowship. Upon hearing the quote, Peggy laughed and said, I have always found husbands more satisfactory after marriage than during. Peggy took lover after lover for the rest of her life. Some rumors claiming her affairs totaled 1,000, though in Peggy's own memoirs, it's a much more conservative 400. In 1937, she's collecting art for this gallery she had in mind, writing to her friend Emily Coleman, I am in Paris working hard for my gallery and fucking. My fucking is only a sideshow. My work comes first every time. Jackson Pollock once famously stated, to fuck her, you'd have to put a towel over her head. And many suspected her voracious sexual appetite stemmed from the need to boost her confidence as an unattractive woman with a potato nose and that she was looking to replace her father, who she had been very close to before his untimely death. Or she could have just been horny as hell. Her friend and art historian, Herbert Reed, once compared her to Rousseau and Casanova, and she was by her own admission a nymphomaniac, and she stated she had many, many abortions. She once spent four days in a hotel room with Samuel Beckett and didn't get out of bed for anything except the doorman delivering champagne. She said she had never met anyone like him, and his conversation was stimulating. American novelist Mary McCarthy said Peggy popped into bed with people the way you would pop into a cathedral when abroad. She regarded sexual intercourse as a quick transaction with the beautiful. The same novelist also wrote this paper thin veiled story that essentially called Peggy a slut, to which Peggy eloquently said, okay. In 1938, right before World War II, she opens the Guggenheim Jeune Gallery in London, where she exhibits works of Cocteau, Moore, and Tanguy. Tanguy's wife allegedly hurled a fish of an unknown variety at Peggy during a dinner party after finding out she was sleeping with her husband. Then in 1940, the Nazis are tearing shit up in Europe, and her friends are like, Googs, you gonna, you know, you gonna get the hell out of Europe or what? You're super Jewish. And Peggy goes, so? I got shit to do. Hitler? Who's Hitler? I'm Peggy goddamn Guggenheim, and there's art to be preserved. And right as the soldiers are marching into the city, she has this art smuggled into New York inside of bedclothes and casserole dishes. She was committed to buying one piece of art a day, resulting in 125 modern masterpieces that were saved from destruction, including multiple Picassos she got herself and everything she had purchased out of Paris just two days before the Nazis arrived. She consequently found herself the owner of one of the world's most respected collections of abstract expressionism. The New Yorker critic Calvin Tompkins is quoted as saying, she managed to put together the nucleus of one of the great collections for almost a laughable sum of $40,000. It should also be noted that Peggy asked the Louvre to help her out by storing the various paintings and sculptures, but the Louvre says, nah, these suck, no thanks, they're not worth saving. She ended up eventually acquiring the 18th century Palazzo Venere de Leone 
that would become her residency and museum that still hosts the Peggy Guggenheim collection today. Truman Capote wrote a book there. Tennessee Williams, Mary McCarthy, and Prince Philip went to her wild parties that could have given Burning Man a run for its money. Gregory Corso told Allen Ginsberg he was dancing through Picasso's and Arp's and Ernst's with Peggy Guggenheim. She set it up so the public was admitted three days a week, and she'd pop up to the roof in her huge sunglasses to sunbathe, while her house guests would be intruded upon in their bedrooms by strangers touring the home. Peggy was always the richest person in the room, and seemed to enjoy the dependency others had on her. Her friend Emily Coleman once said she couldn't figure out whether Peggy is a saint or the meanest person I have ever met. Her friends often complained of her stinginess, saying she was legendary for being cheap, served canned food at her parties, counting the slices of ham in her fridge to make sure the servants weren't stealing any. She once ruined a vacation in Mexico because she thought the hotel had overcharged her five cents. And she slept with the artist Brancusi before purchasing a large metal sculpture from him called Bird in Space because she thought if she had an affair with him, the bird would be cheaper. As Peggy aged, she had fewer lovers and more Lhasa Alpso dogs, many she had buried on the grounds of the Palazzo. She was also incredibly pessimistic about the state of the art world by 1960. When she was publishing her memoirs, she stated, I don't care for Andy Warhol, and I do not like art today. The painting at the Biennale Venice gets worse every year. Everybody just copies the people who did interesting things 20 years ago, getting more and more stereotyped and more and more boring. Then when returning to New York, after having spent 12 years in Venice, she is quoted as saying, I was thunderstruck. The entire art movement had become an enormous business venture. Only a few persons really care for paintings. The rest buy them from snobbishness or to avoid taxation. Presenting pictures to museums and being allowed to keep them until their death as way of having your cake and eating it. Some painters cannot afford to sell more than a few paintings a year as now they are the people to be taxed. Prices are unheard of. People only buy what is the most expensive, having no faith in anything else. Some buy merely for investment, placing pictures in storage without even seeing them, phoning their gallery every day for the latest quotation, as though they were waiting to sell stock. Of course today, paintings are investments, categories that investment houses now define, most literally. I think it has gone to hell as a result of the financial attitude. People blame me for what is painted today because I had encouraged and helped this new movement to be born. I am not responsible. Today is the age of collecting, not of creation. Peggy died in 1979 at the age of 81. She was cremated and buried on the grounds of the Palazzo, and the museum opened a few years later after her death. The artwork is displayed today as she designed it. One wall is devoted to her daughter, Peggy. Guggenheim, like many of the folks featured on Dirty Bits, was a bit of a contradiction, and I think she was well aware. She nurtured and cared for artists and their work, but couldn't do the same with her own children. She was incredibly wealthy, but only purchased two dresses a year in order to pour her money into the arts. She was one of a handful of women working in the art industry that was largely dominated by men. She is responsible for saving much of the contemporary artwork Hitler despised and claimed that she didn't have any concerns for her own safety, but simply for her collection. She discovered and promoted artists and work that had never been seen before. All of the artists she supported at the time were for the most part struggling and misunderstood, and they survived through Peggy's patronization or fraternization. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or corrections for me, let me know in the comments section. See you next Tuesday. Hey, what's up guys? I'm Rhett from the Brain Trust Brothers Network here to talk about what we have to offer you. 
If you like listening to interesting people talk about themselves, then check out the Brain Trust Brothers podcast. Every Tuesday, I sit down with someone that I find interesting and talk to them about who they are and what they do. If catching up on the news surrounding Hollywood is your thing, then check out the Peanut Gallery every Saturday. With interviews from people in the industry to us nerding out about upcoming film, you are sure to get a healthy dose of all things pop culture. If you would like to learn more about us, then check out BraintrustBros.com or follow us on Twitter at BraintrustBros. Hey y'all, it's Corey here from a little podcast called Omitted. If you like this episode, then I'm sure you'll like what I'm putting together. I spend a season at a time highlighting the lesser known stories from some of history's biggest events. Titanic, Pearl Harbor, the Civil Rights Movement. You've heard the stories, but have you heard all of them? I don't think you have. So after this episode is done, do a search on your favorite podcatcher for Omitted. That's O-M-I-T-T-E-D. Hope to see you soon. Hi guys, this is Arielle, host of Murder Under the Midnight Sun, an Alaskan true crime podcast. I'm a lifelong Alaskan, and while the state is beautiful, it does have a dark side. So if you're interested in hearing about true crime stories you've never heard of before, and also learning a little about the 49th state, give me a listen. I'm on iTunes and Stitcher.